Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here today with resident musician Michael Kester. Oh yeah, I guess that does apply today. For uh, for another episode of Double Feature. Yeah. It's a live music that makes things explode episode of yes. Double Feature. Wow. It's not spontaneous. There is a cause. Yeah, you really hold it in. We have some cult musical comedies yeah. uh, today. What, what are those? We're going to do This is Spinal Tap and then Rock and Roll High School. So if you haven't seen these two movies, uh, pretty infamous movies, yeah. I hadn't seen these two movies. You hadn't seen either so of them? I hadn't seen either of them. Can oh. you believe that? Huh. Yeah. Um, we got a Christopher Guest movie. We have a fucking Ramones movie. I yeah. had not seen either of these films. Yeah. If you are like I once was, well, yeah, then you, uh, you want to use the chapters built into our show to uh, skip over the film you haven't seen. Or if you just don't want to hear us talk about one of the films, Mm -hmm. also possible. If If you find that this show is sucking at some point, you can hit skip and you can go to the next part of the show where hopefully we will have picked up our game a little bit. Yeah. Sounds like a legitimate plan. I think so. It'll probably still suck at that point. I mean, if it, it just goes downhill from here. Once we get past the chapters, I don't really know what we're doing from there. This part, I I feel like I've gotten pretty good. Um, After this, I, I got nothing. So we'll start with uh, This is Spinal Tap from the 80s. This is our 80s film This is an 80s flick. It's a cult film. It is one of... I can call this Spinal Tap, right? No one's going to get mad at me. Spinal Tap, totally fine. It's just Spinal Tap. It's fine. I'm pronouncing the umlaut. (laughs) You can hear that (laughs) on the end, right? Absolutely. It's possibly one of the biggest cult films of all time. It's up there with Rocky Horror, though there's fewer people who dress up like it and go throw bread at each other. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, Probably you could use some of the same costumes, I think, specifically if you play bass. Uh, But Spinal Tap was um, one of the early Christopher Guest movies. Christopher Guest is, um, he played Nigel Tufnell in this film, and he didn't direct, but he wrote it with with the other guys, with Michael McKean and Harry Shearer and Rob Reiner. But... Christopher Guest is notable as being that guy who makes those funny mockumentaries right. that come out every five years. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Best right. in Show, A Mighty Wind. You know, yeah. movies where people are doing typically For your consideration, man. You yeah. can't forget that one. That's the other one. Um, yeah. People are doing typically mundane things, and then goofy people are trying to have a good time with it. Yeah, right. Um, I love you know the subjects of these documentaries. You uh, you hear about these things. And it could either be an obscure documentary or it could be something he's made. You don't always come to the documentary going, well, that's about a funny topic. Sure. You know what I mean? This one is probably the most obvious for, yeah. oh, we'll make a, a what, what did Rob Reiner's character call it? Rockumentary. Thank you. Rockumentary. Oh, my God. But this, something like Best in Show, you know, you, you find these things that... Um, sometimes you make documentaries about obscure stuff. Some of the, the best documentaries I can think of were things, let's just even look at stuff we've done on the show, right? Uh-huh. Um, King of Kong. Yeah, pops up, Pops out immediately. Sure. Or and something that, like Murder yeah. Ball. Uh, Exit Through the Gift Shop. Sure, <laughs> sure. They all tend, well, Exit Through the Gift Shop, I mean, now we're kind of running the gamut here, right? Because Exit Through the Gift Shop, we're going to cover an entire genre of sure. arts, an entire medium, really, right. of art. And Whereas then you King you move, of Kong is the Donkey Kong high score. Yeah, Murder one ball. specific uh, <laughs> yeah. um, bookkeeper's Donkey Kong high score. So, you know, you kind of make a documentary wherever you find a compelling story. And here, I, I think you can almost feel these guys having these conversations and going, oh, you know, there's something funny to that. Yeah. I think we could do something with that. And uh, Spinal Tap comes really before any of those well, that'd be funny. I guess let's do a sure. documentary about that. This is it it seems like a documentary epic. Yeah, it does. And the thing about Christopher Guest movies and that really transcends all of them is he's got this so we've talked about it with Rodriguez Tarantino, the uh kind of um I don't know, the filmmaker He's got a troop. Yeah, it's a troop. That's that's the word I was looking for. He's it's got a, a group of people who show up in all of these things. Yeah, well him and, and Michael McKean are are pretty much the staples. And Christopher right. Guest started directing shortly after this. He sure. started directing the movies that they were writing. 
Um, Rob Reiner tends to be involved. Harry Shearer tends to be in it. You know who's strangely not in? I mean, you think back to like Best of Show or Waiting for Guffman or really all of the movies sure. you mentioned. Uh, Eugene Levy. Yeah. Writes basically all of those. Yeah. Uh, with Christopher Guest. I, I don't think any Eugene Levy here. Not no, yet. No, definitely not in Spinal Tap. Yeah, but then shows up in uh, in all of these other movies. So he's kind of the rare exception. Yeah to a lot of the actors that would continue to work with Christopher Guest in the other movies. I guess a little less Rob Reiner and a little more yeah. Eugene Levy. Well, and I think that's I think that's a lot of the mechanic is having somebody else to help him write and kind of because the thing is is it's a matter of if it ain't broke don't, don't fix it. it. <laughs> right. Uh right. so if something like Spinal Tap happens and everybody in the fucking world thinks... I mean, there are people going around touting best film of all time. Yeah. Right. Uh, what was that review you were telling me about? Well, and it's it's not alone. There's an IGN review that's 11 out of 11, I yeah. think. Uh, I'm pretty sure IMDb has it listed yeah, the I same remember way. It. There's, uh, Rotten Tomatoes doesn't, but they operate on a five. What is it? A splat I, yeah, scale? Something splats. I remember um, last year in... Uh, in November of uh, November of 2011 on the 11th of November, everybody was touting Nigel Tuffman day. Oh yeah. It is Nigel Tuffman day today. Everybody shouting from the roof. I saw a bunch of shit on the internet, but it's weird. It, I, I feel like fans almost do the film a disservice by picking up the 11 joke. The is, 11 joke is the weakest part of the film. <laughs> it's the, it's the broad comedy. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, cause I, I was telling you, cause this is the second time I've seen it ever. Mm -hmm. And the things that stand out to me are, first off, uh, the two songs, Big Bottom Girls or whatever it's fucking called. <laughs> That's Big definitely Bottom. not the name of the song. Uh, what's it called? But um, I don't know what it's called. It's Big probably Bottom. called Big Bottom. Um, with, That's the one. Yeah, it is Big Bottom because yeah. it's the one with the three bases. The, no, four bases. <laughs> Is it four bases? he's got a double bass. Oh, that doesn't count. <laughs> no, no, he's got a double neck bass. Yeah. Double bass is um, saying anger, I right. think. Yeah. Um, double bass. Uh. So. <laughs> sorry. That's so how you I'm know sorry. it's metal, man. It's got a double the bass. The multiple bass thing like had me rolling with well, laughter. I, it sounds like the song <laughs> is all bass. It, no, it is. It is all bass. So it's so, okay, right? Um, I don't know if you read in the credits because I was checking to verify, but all of the musicians on stage are performing. Oh, they awesome. recorded the songs. Good, yeah. So they're playing the songs. Well, they've done uh, live shows as Spinal yeah, Tap before, yeah. so clearly they know how to play the song. <laughs> but but uh, and th so so there's Big Bottom, which I love, and then I don't know the name of the song that they're playing. But Can the we also mention just briefly that having all bass is a fitting arrangement for a song yeah, called Big hell? Bottom? It gives it this this funny kind of yeah, like double meaning. It's hilarious. Yeah, I love that. Oh. Trey Parker and Matt Stone must be huge Spinal oh, yeah. Tap fans. Gotta if be. for no other reason than the accomplishment of the film <laughs> Spinal Tap. You know, a bunch of comedians get together, form yeah. a band for this fake documentary that then becomes uh, kind of a real documentary yeah. about the formation of a band for a fake documentary yeah. because these guys then go off and create albums and, you know, <sighs> Uh, play shows. It's amazing. And then the other thing that I love is uh, I don't remember the name of the song, but the one where Harry Shearer's character gets stuck in the cocoon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the entire song yeah, until the and end. And then he gets out and then he just has to scurry back in. And he, oh my God. I think Harry Shearer is probably the sleeper highlight of the film he is um he well so he has that moment which is kind of a physical comedy moment and there aren't a lot of those no in, there's not in the film but there's a couple uh but he also you know he talks about being the um what did he say he's the temperature between yeah the well other there's two. fire and ice right so he's lukewarm yeah he's lukewarm water. which is the bassist yeah. in so many bands yeah. so harry shearer Derek smalls i think is his name yeah. in the movie He's, uh, you probably recognize him from other stuff, but I didn't know he did a bunch of voices oh, for yeah. The Simpsons. Yeah, the, well, The Simpsons cast is five core people, and he's half of them. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I knew Ned, and I knew the reporter is Kent. Kent right? Brockman. Yeah, don't watch The Simpsons. Yeah, so then that's, he does, that's he all does I know. Smithers, he does Chief Wiggum. I was surprised by Smithers. Yeah, I don't know why. He's all over in that show. Yeah, he's in there, and then uh, Michael McKean is the singer. Right. And Rob Reiner is the documentarian. Uh, do you remember what, what his name is in the um, Marty, right? Because yeah, they yeah, say yeah, the yeah. film is yeah. right, directed by him. So he's not part of the band, but is the documentarian. Sure. 
Rob Reiner, we talked about before when we did Misery, which was a strange. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a weird. That's uh, right. Mo- I don't think we talked about how weird that was for, for Rob Reiner's career. Yeah. Doing because well, he's a he's a comedy. Well, he did you know the Princess Bride yeah. and a lot of that stuff in the eighty. Uh, Stand by Me. You know, then to see him do Misery, and I guess this is a little bit of a departure from that too. Yeah. But a guy who kind of will work in any genre where he finds an interesting project. Sure. Well, this also isn't the first time we've seen Michael McKean, Christopher Guest, and Harry Shearer all together on really? the feature. Well, when was the other? Small Soldiers. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Wow, Spinal yeah, all Tap those guys. does the voices of the Gorgonites yeah, in yeah. Small Soldiers. <laughs> um, they all kind of lend their... It's, that's one of, it's one of the reasons I was you excited to see You told me that Spinal on Tap. that show. Yeah. You told me that when we were planning this for this year. <laughs> you told me that before we watched the film, and I still fail to remember it every time. Spinal Tap plays everybody except for Archer, who sure. I think is Frank Langella. Langella, I don't. Names It'd be fun of to actors. go back and watch that now that oh, I've yeah. seen Spinal Tap and kind of hear those voices. So I wanted to ask you, being a musician, how much of a similarity you see between you know I'm kind of interested in the line where this obviously it's making fun of these band members, but I feel like it's making fun of kind of that lifestyle as a whole yeah. a little bit more. You know, it really you know so. I hate when people liken things to The Office because the one thing I hate about the TV show The Office, Mm -hmm. and there's a few things I don't like, but I don't hate the show, is that everybody says, oh my God, it's just like where I work. And as if they don't realize that's why the show is popular. Sure, right. The reason the show is popular is because it's just like where everyone works. Right. But that's the case with Spinal Tap is the reason Spinal Tap is popular is it's just like every band. It's just like where you work, Michael. Yeah, it's every, every band has shocking similarities to spinal tap there's always a member that you keep replacing yeah right for me it's the keyboardist (laughs) sure um there's always the member like the keyboardist of spinal tap who you're not even you don't even know where they come from yeah they just show up and then play shows and then talk weird and you're not friends with them yeah right and there's uh then there's the two guys that constantly butt heads and write the majority of the music sure and then there are in in my case multiple but then there's the uh there's the derricks who facilitate the two people that argue the most right yeah um and and try to you know massage the creative process <laughs> sure um sure right it's really just people getting mad and people having these grand plans that never come to full fruition sure and uh and that's an interesting dynamic do you think it it changes at all as a band is because i mean we're introduced to them and we get this idea they're fucking huge yeah and then as time goes on, it's kind of, re- well, it's both revealed and they also become sure. a smaller and well, smaller band. Yeah, it's, see, the thing is, is it's, it, the the film, it's a series of missteps. Mm-hmm. Um, it starts with, I mean, I think the first misstep is a, what, a reunion tour. Yeah, okay. Of a hair metal band, right? Yeah. Although it was the 80s. Uh, and then you have the album art with the yeah, sexy... Right shove the glove kiss the glove <laughs> right. smell the glove yeah smell the glove smell the glove good um, job and then so there's that misstep and the shows keep getting canceled and you know you bring on the new manager but i think yeah i think i like the dynamic of especially like the cover art it's because it's a metal band that they have the the logo the brand sure of the way the spinal tap with the umlau and it looks like knives yeah, yeah. it makes them seem huge sure that's just your initial reaction. Plus, they have the hair and the rock star facade. Sure. And the big skull. It's all that brutal legend stuff. Yeah, yeah. It feels perfect. epic. It feels huge. But then they're playing in hotels and right. airport right. hangers. Anywhere they can. With yeah. puppets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with or end. without puppets. <laughs> toward the end. Uh, it's, it's weird. I remember I was in a band in high school for, I mean, months. Not even, yeah. not even long enough to remember names of our songs. But in the five or whatever shows that we played, I probably encountered similar experiences in all of this. Yeah. And at no point are we playing arenas. We're yeah. a band in high school. We couldn't even make it to our own Battle of the Bands. Sure. Right? But you still, you show up to play a show, you get a huge idea about what it's going to be, you land there, and you're with puppets. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, that's exactly what happens. <laughs> in you... fact, that seemed to be how every single one of our shows went, is yeah. that we were always with puppets on the, the day where we arrived. That's, yeah, that's, that's a huge part of it, is showing up and being disappointed. But you still treat it 
Like it's huge. Well, and you treat it like it's serious, and you treat if five people show up. It's still a, sure. you got to play well, the show. The thing about being in a band is you treat every situation like it's make or break. Right. Yeah. You treat every situation like <laughs> this is the moment that we're finally going to make. You could it. make it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I mean. That's what happens. Well, Michael, throughout you this never film. know who's in the audience. I mean, yeah. it could be anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking about a band as a unit, I mean, all of these different things are are interesting about it to me. The other one is. You know, we're mocking these guys. Uh, anytime you are making fun of a group of people, thinking back to other, you know, kind of farcical comedies, it's because they're terrible at what they do. Right. And I don't think Spinal Tap, they're certainly not writing serious music or anything sure. that's going to go down as greatest songs ever written. But I remember that scene where they're at Elvis's grave. Yeah. And they can harmonize on the spot. I mean, they're they're yeah. trying to figure out where the harmonies yeah. rest. And yeah. if one sounds a little more, uh, what was it? I can't remember, but I know. Yeah. He's basically making fun of yeah. uh, kind of the scale he's, that the guy's Yeah, he's making fun harmony. of his harmonic choices. Right, yeah. They're technically proficient, let's say, yeah. at what they do. And for a movie that you think is kind of describing people as buffoons and, you know, showing all of their weakest moments. Yeah. Right. It's the same thing reality TV does now without being scripted. Sure. It takes totally normal people who probably aren't the dumbest people you've ever met, but then uh, shows their worst moments where they say things that are blisteringly right. stupid. And so I kind of wonder, is, is there anything to be respected of the fictional group that is Spinal Tap or are they... Uh, are they just technically proficient? Is that just something that happens with musicians? Well, I think with Spinal Tap specifically, you think they're a bunch of dorks. And going back to the unscripted thing, probably just speaking off the cuff. I think a lot of this film is oh, fucking yeah, ad-libbed. Oh, it's totally um, ad-libbed. Yeah. This is but, one of the, the few times you get a mockumentary that's ad-libbed yeah. that people think is ad-libbed and actually is. Yeah. You were just talking about The Office. Yeah. It got really big because everybody went, oh, cool, ad-libbed show. wing it. But it's, it's all not scripted, at all, super scripted, which is a, a total insult to the people, yeah, who, but the poor people who write it. That's Ricky Gervais technique. I mean, anytime yeah. you see Ricky Gervais in a film and he does stutters and pauses and starts a sentence and stops, sure. he wrote that. Oh, Merchant's the that's, same way. Yeah. yeah. Both of those guys. Um, it's Pilkington who's at living <laughs> because that's really, that's really all that's up there. But going back to a different power trio. Oh, right. Spinal Tap on stage is always motherfucking spinal tap sure even in a shitty room with a shitty sound system right, right. they still look and sound so badass God. and so kingly among you know these other fucking musicians and peasants yeah. around them and little dwarven people sure. dancing around stonehenge i'm so jealous of people with uh, that just Dwarfs. ooze musical talent like oh, that yeah, yeah. Because you can find people who are complete burnouts, have literally no skill in life, and are great musicians. Yeah. I don't think I'm a simpleton, and, uh, and yet I, it's, it's hard for me to write music. Yeah. Um, you and I did our theme. I did all the music for right. it. And it, it's 30 seconds long, and it took me fucking two years or something to... <laughs> I mean, I have to work at it. It's hard. Yeah. I can do it. It's really fucking hard. Um, some people get together and they, you go, how does this person tie their shoes? But they can write a song. Yeah. Oh, man, can they write a song? It's one of those things like writing music art in general is it's a lot of it is just, I don't want to say, and I don't believe. Are you going to say accidental? No. Well, partially, but I don't believe that art is the kind of thing that you're born with or that is just in you. Sure. I think people who are proficient at art understand it on a level more fundamentally than people who don't get it. Okay. Somebody who knows how to paint. Yeah. Yeah. Understands what they're creating a lot more technically and in a different perspective than the average person. Sure. They get how the colors work. They're aware of where shading goes. They know you don't use lines. Sure. Things that people just take for granted. They just understand because yeah. of the way they learned it or the way they see it. And that's how a prodigy in an art comes to be is they just understand that art form in a particularly exceptional way but they're not born with any special ability sure it's sure. not handed down my dad was a great guitarist so now yeah, i'm a great right, guitar no it right. doesn't it's it comes from your understanding of the subject if your dad was a great guitarist you probably were exposed to that when you were young sure and you get it on a different level because you've been seeing it for so long sure well and sometimes things are, are picked up because of kind of societal reasons yeah or trend. sure hair metal in general right yeah i i don't 
think there's anything really profound about hair metal. But if it's written in, say, a vague enough way, yeah, it becomes a, a top show. We talked, uh, I don't remember on what show, I was talking about the marketability of Jason Mraz, yeah. right? And that, you know, if you speak generally and vaguely enough or about certain topics that are consistent through all of humanity, everybody goes, wow, I can identify with that. Sure. Someone else feels this way. So, you know, there there is some combination of you have enough talent to create music but also the things you want to say either appeal to other people or maybe, you know what, maybe you uh, can't tie your shoes, but you have interesting things going on in your head. Yeah. And as long as you can express those, then you become a musician people, uh, people seek out. Yeah, well, and speaking on hair metal, I think that hair metal is one of the biggest things in music to just solely exploit a genre. You think so? Well, I think Kiss happened. And mm -hmm. then a bunch of people went, if we look scary, we don't have to be that good. Yeah. Um, well, you know, rebellion. And we'll talk yeah. about that a and little bit with And Ramones. that's what it becomes is, is you, you start catering to the audience that likes to see these big images. Going back sure. to what you were saying, you know, stuff they can identify with. Deep-rooted social societal things. Right. And you see these big guys with their grand hair and elaborate costumes. And you sure. think, like, it's just, you, you see them and you think that they are putting out these, you know, huge, epic things, this epic art. Right. And you can latch onto that because you don't have to even know what the lyrics are to know that it feels like you're winning. Yeah. You icons know? of rock. Yeah. Monsters of rock. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Even though when we're talking about icons here, it's three guys, a mystery keyboard player, and a rotating yeah. drummer. What did they say? 37 people or something? 37. That were in the band. The uh, Talking about the drummer and the law of averages. I also like the law of averages as a concept. Uh, I believe it states that people are most likely to invoke the law of averages only if they have no real understanding of the <laughs> law of averages. I've never actually heard that in a useful place, only by people to basically sound sciencey right. when they're saying, oh, it should all average out. Yeah. But that's another one of those things, too, the, the drummer disappearing or the rotating member. That does seem to be a thing that happens, uh, especially in, you know, big bands, big rock stuff. When you see a band kind of get taken over by a record company, mm -hmm. or maybe not even taken over. I mean, I kind of think of, you know, the difference between an independent movie and a huge produced blockbuster sure. theatrical movie. A band that would play smaller venues versus a band that plays arenas. Yeah. And once that, uh, once that stuff kind of gets rolling, so much of it becomes under the hands of the record label. So, you know, somebody gets out and you... I always think about Evanescence when that stuff happens yeah. because their lineup changed so many times. I mean, that's true of so many big bands, but you know, Evanescence came out with an album. They had five members and then people realized, well, everyone recognizes the singer, Amy sure. Lee, right? Fucking yeah. pop icon, pop rock icon uh, on MTV and stuff. We can change out the other four members. Yeah. No one will notice. Sure. There's probably been 37 people. Yeah, it's in true. And, and there are, there are bands. I mean, look at something like Linkin Park. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Linkin Park came yeah, out? Yeah, sure. It was Mike Shinoda, Chester Bennington, and then three, four guys that looked similar. <laughs> One of them had earmuffs. Sure, sure. Um, as long as that guy had earmuffs when they got a new guy, <laughs> right? It, you wouldn't know. Have they changed the lineup? I, I mean, I wouldn't know. I don't know. I think they're a techno band now. I think Mike Shinoda left. <laughs> okay. No, that's Julian Chester. K. That's that's uh, Orgy, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, you're yeah. right, because Chester Bennington does stuff yeah. on Julian K, which yeah. is orgy. Yeah. We're starting to slowly drift back into territory, I understand. Yeah. Well, Chester Bennington is busy being in the Saw films. And, oh, yeah, that's uh, right, too. And uh, something else. And we've brought things back to films. Way yeah. to go, double feature. Oh, he was also in Crank, too, wasn't he? So maybe the record label is the one going, uh, quick, plug another member in there. Sure. I mean, I love by the end of the film, a drummer disappears and another one just reappears yeah. on stage. Yeah. They just have them waiting in the wings. So we have a second film today, which is, I mean, if we're, okay, so we talked about hair metal and how hair metal is about rebellion, mm -hmm. but rebellion is actually, I believe, inscribed in the halls of punk rock. Yeah. Right. That is where musical rebellion lives right and the ramones are the hair metal band of punk rock <laughs> yeah so tell me about uh i want to know before we talk about this movie at all okay <laughs> um here's what i knew about the ramones before okay. yeah they come in a monochromatic black and white yep so when i saw them in a color film and they were moving around first of all there's something to be said about that because yeah. a lot different than the picture i had in my sure. head of the ramones 
I also know every Ramon song and I've never listened to one of their albums yeah. <laughs> because they're fucking everywhere. But I kind of wanted to know your stance just so everyone will get angry and email us. Uh-huh. Um, I grew up thinking that I grew up far after the Ramones. Sure. I was not a person who actually had the Ramones in high school. Uh-huh. I probably experienced that secondhand as a bunch yeah. of people who remember back to it, it, their parents basically yeah. had the Ramones right. in high school. I remember the Ramones being, oh, that's where punk started. Yeah. And I kind of grew up never challenging that idea. Uh, but you say the the closest thing to hair metal. Of, yeah, the Ramones are really, the Ramones. Where so, do they fit in the punk scene? Am uh, I already offending people by calling the Ramones punk no, rock? No, is that probably fair? Anybody, anybody who's going to argue with the Ramones being a punk band can fuck off because okay. punk is a mindset. Sure. Um, plus, the Ramones are definitely a punk band, even with just the way they play guitar. It's all power chords. It's four chord rock. It's a lot of repeating, a lot of chanting. Accessibility, and, right? Well, see, that's where, that's the differentiation. Punk okay. is not supposed to be accessible. Oh, interesting. When punk first started in the late 70s, and there was something... I mean, it started accessibly. There's stuff like when it came over from the UK, right. um, notably the Sex Pistols. Sure. That's accessible. That seems like a more legitimate There's melodies, origin of punk. It's catchy. God Save the Queen, Anarchy in the UK. These are songs you can actually sing. Right. Um, by the early not 80s... Not grunting sounds. Angry, well, <laughs> yeah. malnourished grunting sounds. By the early 80s, you got into Bad Brains... The Damned, Black Flag. Black Flag has an album with no music. Really? Black Flag, it has. They, they came out with this record, two or three records in, where the first half of the record is Henry Rollins doing spoken word, and the second half of the record is instrumental tracks. Wow. Yeah. That's punk. I was punk. not aware of that. The, See, when I think punk, I think, okay, so the rebellion thing is obviously huge for me when you talk yeah. about being more a mindset uh, than a genre. But I also think about this kind of riot idea. Sure. This kind of uh, playing on the floor. Well, yeah. Well, that I mean, that's why I think accessibility, because I think about chanting. I think about everybody can get together. They can play this song. It's a fucking riot song. But the accessibility of punk, again, is not the music. It's the mindset. Okay. And if you go to a Bad Brains show, if you went to a Black Flag show back in Washington, D.C. when they first kicked off, Mm -hmm. you would walk in the room and just like I was saying with Spinal Tap, you didn't know what they were singing, but you knew they were pissed and you knew who they were pissed at. Sure. And you were pissed too. Sure. It That'll didn't, show them. It didn't matter if you could sing along. Right. But the thing about punk is that eventually it became not about melodies. It became about... That's why I think Henry Rollins is such a huge punk icon because he divorced himself from melodies so early. It became about the words. It right. became about being able to say things. Sure. And the Ramones are a surf pop band. Right. Um, masquerading as a punk band because sure. they're still about <laughs> sure. rebelling against adults. But Black Flag has a song called Gimme, Gimme, Gimme. And it's about, you know, wanting to fucking blow shit up. Right. That's the song. I mean, there, there's a line. I know the world's got problems. I've got problems of my own. They're not the problems that can't be fixed by an atom bomb. Yeah. That's a Black Flag lyric. Perfect Circle did the cover. And then the Ramones, their big rebellion hit is Rock and Roll High School. <laughs> sure. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. Like yeah. the Ramones are a surf pop band that managed to have some anti-establishment, you know, vibe. And, and parents didn't like them because they looked weird and they were dirty. Sure. And they wore leather and tore jeans. Right, and right. They were, basically, they were basically the rock and roll version of the Ninja Turtles. Well, that's the thing is um, knowing that punk can go to some dark places. Yeah. And then seeing the Ramones, right. literally only seeing them as their branding shows sure. them in black and white. Uh, the thing that surprised me as I'm watching them in the movie is they're all cute and awkward. But maybe more awkward yeah, than cute. Very. But it's very consumable. And yeah. then it's uh, it's awkward. Let's just lean on that awkward word for a, a moment. But that brings me to a point that I want to make about the film in mm-hmm. regards to anything. So Dee Dee Ramone, the bassist. Yeah. Um, very weird in this movie, but regardless, sure. Didi Ramon was a punk bassist. He OD'd and died. Mm-hmm. That's fucking punk, you know. I mean, that's what punk bassists do. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, not to, I'm not condoning doing drugs and killing yourself, but I'm saying if you want something emblematic of the Ramones that says they're still a real punk band, their bassist OD'd. Yeah, that's rock. That's yeah. I mean, that's a symbol of rock and roll. No, I see what you're saying. And um, it gives them a check back in that sure. column. And that's what I was really trying to get at by trying to get Rock and Roll High School on the show is because it's an exploitation film. New World Pictures, 
It's sure. you know Roger Corman's late seventies troupe, Joe Dante, Alan Arkish, Paul Bartel, Mary Warnoff. You know, it's these people that are doing all these exploitation. Piranha came out the same time. Yeah. That was just Jaws. Yeah. Um, it's just that kind of thing. But I feel like they're all in their thirties. You know, they're they're all in their thirties and forties. Sure. They're not in touch with high school. They're not the kids they're, that right. star in this They're movie. trying to exploit the idea of the rock and roll rebellion going on in the youth. Sure. But they're still out of touch. Right. And so right. it's by watching the film and really enjoying it the way I enjoy it, I feel like I'm exploiting their fa- failure to exploit. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. No, I hear you. It's, this isn't the Ramones make yeah, rock and roll right. high school. It's a bunch of people who put the Ramones yeah, exactly. in a movie and called so they Rock don't, and Roll they High School. They're, they're, I mean, the example I gave you is if you made a movie and you were trying to show that the Ramones were, you know, against the establishment and fuck the man how early in the set do they play the kkk took my baby away well if that's your goal well right? yeah if that's your that's goal that's what i mean but the thing is is they it's the exploitation the bottom line is the bottom line as much as we hate to admit it especially in the 70s you need to make a profit on the film sure and parents won't let their 18 year olds go see the kkk took my baby away right but parents will let their 18 year olds go see PJ Souls rock around and be get sure, the most sure. attentions in school ever, and she's nicer than anybody I've met in high school. Yeah, True Punk seems to fall more in that Abel Ferrara kind of yeah. the dirty New York. Yeah, but I mean, I throw around something like True Punk. I just think that's the that's the darker side of things. That's when sure. it gets in really deep and heavy. Yeah, well, it's, I don't mean uh, to say anything bad about when I say the Ramones are accessible. I mean that in the same way that Hairspray was about revolt. Yeah. I wouldn't say that Hairspray was deep or dark or quote unquote true punk, but it's still fucking brilliant. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, what's great about it is the accessibility. The, yeah, that's the subversion. Yeah. Is if you can get it in, the Ramones are the gateway drug to punk. Sure. You know, sure. Th- that's why that's why I, I love thinking of punk being bookended by the, you know, Sex Pistols Ramones. Because yeah. those are the accessible sure. ones. The Sex Pistols are so accessible. Right. You, I mean, it's really difficult not to like the Sex Pistols. And it's really difficult not to find something you like in the Ramones. Yeah. Let's Creek Bop, Rob Zombie did the cover. It's not going anywhere. Sure. Let's Creek Bop is possibly one of the most known punk songs ever. There's some staying power to these yeah. songs is what you're saying. And that's something that uh, TV Party or Salt on a Slug by mm-hmm. Black Flag. Mm-hmm. Name a Black Flag song. Exactly. Your hands are up in the air. No <laughs> you shrugging over you here. Black flag fans can name black flag songs. Yeah. Human beings can name Ramon songs. Human beings know never mind the bollocks, here's the sex pistols. Sure. I know video drone songs that reference black flag. Yeah. And that's all I got. <laughs> I mean I'm I'm I don't mean to get into the music, but I think that's a lot of the mentality of what's great about this film is it's the rebellion and the failure to rebel and that failure being why the Ramones are the perfect poster child sure. for rock and roll high school. Sure. You couldn't have if they because they would ruin the credibility of something like the damned or something like the dead Kennedys. Yeah. And they probably wouldn't have done the film. Yeah. But the Ramones are. Well, it would be something darker yeah, like I was t- talking about, you know, this is this is the same troupe that's, you know, like I said, putting out Piranha this year. Yeah. This is when Roger Corman started getting into producing all those weird teen space dramas sure, uh, sure. uh night of the comet sure and well uh, and we have some dick miller from yeah. a bucket of blood you right know, we're seeing that i mean this is especially when we get into like the eagle bauer yeah, character yeah. a lot of really good clint characters howard. in this movie clint howard who was ricky in those silent night deadly night films yeah and he's you know he's <laughs> tiny in this movie he's so young and tiny but his face is yeah this, there's no mistaking him <laughs> not a chance a lot of times you see uh, younger actors in slasher movies or whatever, and you go, oh, is that him? Not the case yeah. with Glenn Howard. Not the case at all. But it's, uh, his stuff where he's in that stall office yeah. is some of the most iconic yeah. sections of the movie. I love it. But you can read into a lot of that sort of um, post-Caddyshack, Ferris Bueller's Day Off sort of era of... You know, a Revenge of the Nerds character. Yeah. When 80s, I mean, this is 79, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, over the next 10 years, you would get all of that rebel against school, sort of goofy, physical, kind of dirty humor of a lot of these movies that you see from this character. But it's way an exploitation film, too. I mean, you nailed that. It's kind of this, the genre that never was of sure. exploitation film. 
and really even when we saw this stuff later copied it lost a lot of the elements but the kind of unlikely ally of the music teacher right yeah i love that and that's paul bartell who directed uh death race 2000 awesome yeah (laughs) another exploitation film right another corman film of a well-established genre of or subgenre or whatever you want to call it of exploitation uh, usually when you get these kind of movies, it's all kids resist against the adults, yeah. shame the adults, show how dumb the adults are. But here um, we have this kind of warden of a principal. Sure. Another big, I mean, She's wonderful. all of those scenes are so women in prison, oh, aren't yeah. they? Oh, yeah. They're all oh, yeah. the warden character from, a, this is like Roger Corman snuck in yeah. an exploitation film under the radar. The music teacher likes music, so of course he's going to be their ally. And then the parents are all... Uh, they're kind of middle ground, well, they whatever. They don't the like it. They're kind yeah, of, right. they're, they're lukewarm water. Yeah, exactly what I was thinking. And then the warden. Yeah. The warden is the evil antagonist of the film. By comparison, anybody else just completely pales. But this this is the kind of evil, um, comparatively, and I'm glad you brought up the women in prison thing, because this gives me a really, really good jumping off point to talk about something I wanted to mention. Excited. And so Corman got started. We've talked about Corman pretty extensively. He did these women in prison films, and you know he was in, in charge of doing a lot of the black exploitation stuff, a lot of dark, a lot of gritty, a lot of sex, you know, a lot of blood and violence, and that's what was selling in the you know two dollar down the street theater sure. for a weekend. The reason Rock and Roll High School, Piranha, Night of the Comet, all these movies that he started doing in the late seventies and early eighties become tamer mm-hmm. is because. The film game started changing. They started doing wide releases. You started getting multiplexes in the movie theater. Sure. Film became a family thing. Yeah. And then video. Yeah. And films like fucking The Big Birdcage, films like Women in Cages, films like The Switchblade Sisters, mm-hmm. those aren't films that you're going to buy and <laughs> right. bring put home in your collection right, of films. Right. I mean, I do. But sure. Now we do. Sure. But Corman's thing is making the film that will sell. You're going to sell a lot more of Rock and Roll High School with the cute little, oh, she's kind of rebellious, but she's also sure. adorable. Sure. You you appeal to a wider audience sure. while still being exploitative and that it's about, you know, going against the authority. But it's never going to be as dirty and gritty as it was when there wasn't. I mean, I feel like I feel like almost you have evidence of it. You know, you can go buy the video. It's like you have evidence of how sure. fucked up the movie is. Sure, right. you have to you have to clean up your act if people are going to take it home to their mom. Yeah, but you still see the elements of trying to mass appeal yeah, and make a buck. Absolutely. And, you know, I keep thinking back to the John Waters thing because of the elements that both of them are sharing. John Waters is somebody we talked about another genre of exploitation on one of those early shows, that kind of housewife exploitation. Yeah. I really like the idea yeah. of just creating these I mean, not even just the housewife one, but I guess just uh shotgun approach to exploitation. Oh, let's just make as many genres and see which new yeah. I mean if you're really trying to make money in the exploitation game then, well, I'm going to come up with a new kind of exploitation. And here's how I'm going to do that. I'm going to just exploit every single thing I can think of, one per movie, and eventually something will stick, whether that's the rock and roll high. I mean, rock and roll high school is really the name of the genre, too, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, rebelling against your high school authority through rock music. Right. And then you lose the tickets that you rightfully earned. Yeah. And you yeah. have to get them from the radio. Yeah. <laughs> but you finally make it to Detroit to see Kit or, sorry, where are we? Remote, Ramones. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing what a blueprint this was for that movie, and I'm sure other movies we haven't seen, too. Um, another character that's important to exploitation is the DJ, and not just the radio call-in DJ here, but um, PJ Souls, oh, who yeah. is kind of in the more localized version. Yeah. You seem like you're a big PJ Souls I fan. Love, I love... You know, it's... It's weird because again, this this whole the whole show today to me is about ideas that are purported by these emblems. Yeah, and uh, PJ Souls, I love for the idea of PJ Souls. Sure. What I love about PJ Souls is she comes in, she owns the film, she is so much Riff Randall. Yeah, that is just who she is yep. for an hour and a half. Sure. And then she disappeared. Where the fuck did PJ Souls go? <laughs> I mean, she's gone. She showed up again in Devil's Reject. So did Mary Warrenoff, for the record. Yeah, right. Um, you know who didn't show up there is Leslie Ann Powers. Yeah. Still has not emailed me. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well bring up John Waters one more time yeah, before we get out of here. If you want to talk about where are they now, the where are they now the from where Spinal are they now Tap. Files? 
Yeah, uh, the internet is supposed to fix this problem. Um, the internet would have fixed problems throughout Spinal Tap as well. This is, yeah, this is kind of your thesis on the issue. I don't know why no one has, has told me what happened to Leslie Powers. I just want to know. And albums have been written about where is PJ Souls. Uh, albums? The, the Local H record, Local H from Chicago. Sure. Uh, they wrote an album entitled Whatever Happened to PJ Souls. So they're curious about these questions, yeah. too. And it's and the cover People art is know. lifted from Rock and Roll High School. Yeah. Highly suggest just image searching the cover art for that because it's awesome. I'll link to it if I don't get too lazy. PJ's a character, I mean... Even so, I don't know the actor's uh, name who plays Tom, but um, oh, it's Vince Van Patten. Yeah, so there's that scene where he's talking on the phone, and you know he's sort of a nonsense, fucking throwaway character. Yeah, in one well, of he's these movies. he's supposed to be, but they give him more screen time than that character right. should have. Well, <laughs> so he, he's talking hilarious. on the phone. He's trying to identify which one he is. Of course, yeah. no one knows, and they make a joke about it, and they do it so well because they don't really beat it into the ground but they bring it up often enough for you to know that yeah. they know are you talking about idaho <laughs> he, he he says oh you know i'm i'm tom oh uh, tom the football player i talk about the weather a lot yeah <laughs> you know? they uh they basically make an interesting character out of how boring he yeah. is and then there's the mouse thing yeah too. that's that's a weird that's aspect of, of surrealism that I think was trying to latch on again to the youth. Sure. I think that was a stab at, you know, the it was the adult filmmakers taking a stab at, oh yeah, 18 year old, yeah, they love things in costumes. Sure. Yeah, because, you know, think about what's on TV right now. HR yeah. Puffin stuff. You know, like, yeah, that hadn't been, that wasn't out yet. <laughs> I but don't know. Sesame Street, probably. Something, I'm sure there was something with people in big plush costumes that weren't having sex Steamboat with Willie is what you want. Huh? That's the Steamboat Willie. Yeah. You go all the way back to the first Mickey Mouse. That's how you save yourself on that one. Um, but the children like big animated yeah, things. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that was just an absolute failed ploy of. Sure. <laughs> but, but the thing is. It does make it weird, though. It makes it fucking weird. It makes it weird, but it also, it does pack one hilarious joke which is that they blow up right i mean like the right. drummers of spinal tap sure the rats explode due to rock and roll overload and sure. that's funny no matter how big the rat is or where it is it's almost irreverent humor it's sure. almost just why are why is a mouse exploding yeah um the thing that rock and roll high school gets so everybody else take note people who make music films especially for a movie about what it's about when they do that song pinhead yeah right they're playing it's not a the Detroit Rock City, we finally made it to sure. the stadium. They're not playing in the giant concert hall that basically the thing that Spinal Tap is making yeah. fun of. The sort right. of yeah, perfect. how epic these bands have become and the style of those documentaries, especially in the, yeah, I wouldn't just say in the 80s, into the 90s too. Sure. Like you have it a lot less now, I think. Um, maybe we're just well, done with that. Well, eventually it turned but... into festivals. Like, well, no, I meant the, the style of the documentary being about how huge these guys are. Yeah. And, how gigantic, you know. Well, they're the fucking Ramones. The Ramones are not playing the they're stadium. They're playing CBGBs. They're exactly. playing a little dinky black box nightclub. They are, yeah. It, it's a tiny rock club. It's got a low ceiling. Not that many people fit in it. It looks super uncomfortable. You don't even really need any kind of amplification to hear yeah. to, all the way to the back. Sure. Of, you know, it's the kind of thing where they could all stop and play an unmiked acoustic song yeah. and everybody could fucking hear them. And then the way they shoot it, too, is awesome. The camera's right in Joey's face. It's just, you get this idea that it's claustrophobic. Yeah, and that's that's so punk rock to me. Like, yeah, I that's feel like, how I want to see music, yeah, too. It's yeah. also the only well, venue yeah. I want to see music in. I just like, I like sloshing around in other people's sweat. Perfect. Exactly what you paid to see. Yeah. That's one of the things that I think makes the Ramones what they were. And why I get this idea of them as being uh, less approachable before I knew anything, before realizing this is kind of the, the pet the white cat of mm. this particular breed of music uh, or this particular breed of film. We get back to that club and things are scaring me again. I mean, in the best way possible. Right. So the website you can go to is doublefeatureshow.com to see if I posted a picture of some. I don't even remember what I was supposed to post already. Uh, and the email address to remind me when it's too late is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Um, we have a Facebook, I suppose, and an iTunes and also movies that are happening next time on the show. Lots of movies. Yeah, we have time. lots of movies. It's Killapalooza time. It is. And we're doing, uh, here we go again, doing a fantastically innovative version of Killapalooza. Oh, look at us. We're going to go ahead and do a fucking foreign 
Killapalooza. Oh, no. Yeah, we're going to do the I. Is it too late to change that? No, because oh, I just said it, and it's recorded. Fuck. I'd have to edit that out, and yeah. then we'd have to dub something else All in. Right. Watch more fucking film. Bye.